Iblis, the Satan. He has set and placed in your way to the Jannah seven obstacles. Number one, shirk. Adultery, Allah forgives. Fornication, Allah forgives. Stealing, Allah forgives. Killing, Allah forgives. Anything, Allah forgives. But the shirk. Number two, bid'ah. Anything added to the deen is rejected. Major sins, minor sins, the halal. Number six, giving more priority to the least rewardable over the most rewardable. The seventh obstacle, direct confrontation with the shaitan. Bismillah wa alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu wa ala rasulillahi wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May the peace, blessings and mercy of God Almighty be upon you all. I would like to invite onto the stage one of the most exciting speakers we have here at the peace conference, which is Sheikh Salim Al-Amri from Abu Dhabi in the United Arab Emirates. Just a bit of a background on the Sheikh. Sheikh Salim Al-Amri, as I mentioned, comes from Abu Dhabi in the United Arab Emirates. He studied in the traditional Islamic manner. Among some of his teachers were the early students of Sheikh Muhammad Nasruddin Al-Albani, Rahimahullah, and many other shuyukh. He completed and graduated with a double degree in both engineering and computers and is currently working as an IT manager for an oil company in the United Arab Emirates. Insha'Allah, God willing, today, Sheikh Salim Al-Amri will be talking on the topic of seven obstacles on the way to enter Jannah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Inna alhamdulillah. Ahmaduhu. ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا إنه من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أما بعد فإن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله تعالى وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة كل بدعة ضلالة كل ضلالة في النار أما بعد brothers and sisters in Islam our topic for today seven obstacles in the way to Jannah as it is known to every Muslim or the majority of us that our real home is where? Jannah, insha'Allah. Our father was created in the Jannah, Adam alayhi salam, came down to earth for a test to be tested and the return to Allah again to the Jannah. So our real home, my dear brothers and sisters, is the Jannah by the grace of Allah Azza wa Jal. So that what should be always in our minds. Going home, sweet home. That's the Jannah. That is our home. We should be always thinking of our real home. This home, this world is transient. We're not going to stay here forever but our real home is the Jannah insha'Allah Imam Ibn Al-Qayyim rahimahullah ta'ala he mentioned this beautifully in one of his poems uh, there's a famous poem by Imam Ibn Al-Qayyim known as An-Nuniyah because it rhymes with noon at the end he says 
فحيا على جنات عدن فإنها فحيا على جنات عدن فإنها منازلك الأولى وفيها المخيم فحيا على جنات عدن فإنها منازلك الأولى وفيها المخيم The meaning Hurry up Come Let us race to our home Jannati Adnin, the gardens of bliss. Fainaha, therein, Manazilukal Ula, your first home, your first dwellings. Wafihal Mukhayyamu, and therein we will abide forever. So that is our real home, my dear brothers and sisters, the Jannah. So before we speak about the obstacles, we should know about our home, the Jannah. The Jannah which Allah created already. The Jannah that no one can imagine. What Allah has prepared for us in the Jannah, no one can imagine. Simply, because the human imagination springs from his observations. You cannot imagine something you did not see, true or not? Can you imagine something you did not see? No way. I want you now to imagine the palaces in the Jannah. Close your eyes and imagine. What are the pictures coming? What palaces are coming to your mind? The palaces you have seen, right? Can you imagine the rivers in the Jannah? The rivers you have seen will come to your memory. That means we cannot imagine something we did not see. And the Jannah no one has seen, so we cannot imagine it. So when you are reading the Quran and you read about milk, honey, wine, only the name is common, but the reality is totally different. So what is there is different. That's why in the hadith, Allah says, I have prepared for my servants what no eye has ever seen, no ear has ever heard of. So what is in the Jannah? It is something beyond our comprehension. The palaces in the Jannah are made of one brick gold, another brick is silver. Can you imagine the palaces in the Jannah? One brick is gold, another brick is silver. That's how the palaces are made in the Jannah. And this palace, you can build it by reading Qul Hu Allahu Ahad ten times. If you read Qul Hu Allahu Ahad ten times, as in the authentic hadith, a palace will be built for you in the Jannah. The trees in the Jannah, Prophet Muhammad says in the authentic hadith that the fastest horse will be running in the shade of the tree 100 years. 100 years and this fastest horse is running in the shade of this tree. And the trunk of the tree is made of gold. The palaces in the Jannah, the rivers, they flow from underneath. While you are in your bedroom and rivers of wine, honey, milk, everything within reach. Fruits within reach. You want that grape, the cluster will come down to you. You eat, then the cluster will go up again. And the most important thing in the Jannah, what is the most important thing? The most pleasurable thing, enjoyable thing in the Jannah. What is it? Seeing Allah. Seeing Allah Azza wa Jal. There is a day in the Jannah where all the people of Jannah, all the inhabitants of Jannah, they get together in a place, Suq al-Jannah, the market of Jannah, 
and Allah appears to all of them and they look at Allah and he speaks to every individual faces will be bright illuminated because of the Iman looking at Allah Azza wa Jal that's the most enjoyable thing we will meet there inshallah by his grace Amen. so that's the most important thing to see your Lord in the Jannah and you see your brothers there and then after that gathering Allah says now you can go to the market take whatever you want and go to your homes to your palaces to your wives and the moment their wives received them they would say Masha Allah Masha Allah you are more handsome than when you left now you are more handsome than when you left us in, in the morning whatever and the men will say by Allah you are more beautiful than when we left so what increased their beauty seeing Allah looking at the face of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so that is our real home having said this my dear brothers and sisters the enemy the real enemy the shaitan doesn't want us to reach our destination shaitan was driven out of the jannah right so he doesn't want you to go back to your home he wants you to be with him to be with him in the blazing fire in jahannam he doesn't want to be alone he wants company allah says innama yad'u hizbahu liyakunu min ashab as-sa'ir verily and most certainly he calls his followers his party to be with him in the blaze in jahannam he doesn't want to be alone so that's why he works on the clock shaitan does not spare time very active has many many tricks to fool us because he doesn't want to be alone he wants to take portion portion of the children of Adam may Allah save us from his tricks Amen and this portion is the greatest portion the majority of the children of Adam are destined to hell Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam say sallallahu alayhi wa sallam whenever the name of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is mentioned you say sallallahu alayhi wa sallam otherwise you are sinful and you are bakhil stingy so inshallah you are not stingy huh? okay so Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam he said Allah will ask on the day of judgment Adam imagine all of us are standing in front of our father Adam alayhi salam all the humanity and Allah will say Adam those who are destined for hell from among your children guess what from every thousand nine hundred ninety nine to the hellfire from every thousand nine hundred ninety nine to Jahannam so the majority of mankind are going to hell and if you read in the Quran you will never find Allah praising majorities Allah praised minorities so the majority among the children of Adam will go to hell why, why? because they listen to their enemy Iblis the Satan they followed their own whims and desires Allah has given them the free will to choose Allah guided everyone وَهَدَيْنَاهُ النَّيْدَيْنِ 
And we have showed him the two paths. Allah says, we have showed man the two ways, the way of good and the way of evil. And it is up to you to choose, to make your mind. You hear the adhan, you can go to the masjid or you can carry on sleeping. You hear the adhan, you can come to the masjid or go to the discotheque. It is your choice. No one will force you, no one will compel you to come to the masjid. So you decided to take the other way. So on that day, you blame no one but yourself. Are you following brothers and sisters? Is it clear? Okay. So this enemy will not leave you alone. He's working. He has set and placed in your way to the Jannah seven obstacles. Seven traps. What are they? Write them down. Number one, shirk, associating partners with Allah. Number two, bid'ah, innovations. Bid'ah, innovations. Number three, major sins. Kaba'ir in Arabic, major sins. Number four, minor sins. Minor sins. Sagair. Number five. The halal. Halal is one of the traps of the shaitan, by the way. Okay? Number six, giving more priority to the least rewardable over the most rewardable. In other words, the least rewardable deed has more precedence over the most rewardable deed. This needs explanation. Just write it down. The seventh obstacle, the obstacle of direct confrontation with the shaitan. Direct confrontation. Imam Ibn Qayyim said, this is Aqabat al muragama wrestling station. There you will be wrestling with Iblis. If time permits, we'll cover all of them. If not, question time. Ask me so we can mention them. All right? Inshallah. First one, shirk. What is shirk? Before we explain shirk, we need to know the antithesis, the opposite of shirk. What's the opposite of shirk? Tawheed, mashallah. So the opposite of shirk is the tawheed. So if you know the tawheed, then you will know the, the shirk. If you don't know the tawheed, how can you know the shirk? True or not? Okay. So the tawheed is to single out Allah with all your deeds. All our deeds should be for whom? For Allah. Our prayer for whom? Our fast, our siyam, for Allah. Our sacrifice, for whom? Allah. Inna a'tainaka al-kawthar fasalli li rabbika wanhar. Okay, verily we have given you the fountain. So pray for your Lord and over your sacrifices to whom? To Allah. All my ibadah should be for Allah. How about tawaf? Is tawaf ibadah? Circumambulating the house of Allah, the Kaaba, it is ibadah. Right? Ibadah or not? Okay, it is ibadah. It's an act of worship. Allah says, وَلْيَطَّوَّفُوا بِالْبَيْتِ الْعَتِيقِ وَلْيَطَّوَّفُوا بِالْبَيْتِ الْعَتِيقِ And let them circumambulate the ancient house. So the tawaf should be done only around the Kaaba. So ibadah for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Only Allah. Worship no one but Allah azza wa jal. So the first trap is the shirk. You will not be able to escape and overcome this barrier or obstacle without knowing the Tawheed. So that's why you have to study the Tawheed in order to avoid the shirk. Because if you fall into the trap of shirk, you will never, never enter the Jannah. Who said that? Allah. 
إِنَّهُ مَنْ يُشْرِكْ بِاللَّهِ فَقَدْ حَرَّمَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ الْجَنَّةِ وَمَأْوَاهُ النَّارِ وَمَا لِلظَّالِمِينَ مِنْ أَنْصَرِ Whoever associates with Allah any partner, whoever associates with Allah any partner, فَقَدْ This قَدْ means an article حرف تحقيق means an article of surety which means most certainly the Jannah paradise garden is prohibited for him he will never smell the fragrance of the Jannah and his abode his place and nar Jahannam the fire وَمَا لِلظَّالِمِينَ مِنْ أَنصَارِ And for the wrongdoers, there will not be anyone to help. Wrongdoers means mushriks. In another place, Allah says, إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يَغْفِرُ أَنْ يُشْرَكَ بِهِ وَيَغْفِرُ مَا دُونَ ذَلِكَ لِمَنْ يَشَاءُ وَمَنْ يُشْرِكْ بِاللَّهِ فَقَدْ افْتَرَ إِثْمًا عَظِيمًا We Muslims believe that the only sin which is unforgivable, there is unforgivable sin, is the shirk. So the shirk is the only sin that Allah will not forgive. Anything else, else Allah forgives. Adultery, Allah forgives. Fornication, Allah forgives. Stealing, Allah forgives. Killing, Allah forgives. Anything, Allah forgives. But the shirk. If you die upon shirk, Allah will not forgive it. But he forgives even the shirk if you repent before you die. If you make tawbah before you die, Allah will also forgive you. So the shirk is trap number one. How to overcome it? You need to know the tawheed. And the shirk has many levels or many aspects or types. Number one, what we call it, shirk akbar, major shirk. This is major shirk, it takes the person out of Islam. You become murtad, upstate, major shirk. And that is to offer the ibadah, the worship to anyone other than Allah. You pray to other than Allah. You ask other than Allah. Iyaka na'bud wa iyaka nasta'in. So the major shirk that you offer ibadah, active worship to other than Allah. That is major shirk. This takes a person out of Islam. There is another type which is not major. A person who commits or perpetrates this sin, minor shirk, that this will not take him out of Islam. Like what? You know fortune tellers, magicians, soothsayers, palmists, psychics, so to go to such people and ask them for something and you believe them, if you believe them, Prophet Muhammad said, then that makes you a disbeliever. You disbelieve in the Quran if you believe in what they are saying. And if you just go for just the sake of inquisitiveness, your prayers will not be accepted for 40 days. Four zero, 40 days your prayers will not be accepted. We don't believe in horoscopes. The horoscopes, your day with the stars. What is your star? A Muslim should not read that stuff and should not believe. Why? Because that goes against the fundamentals of Islam. Because who knows the unseen? Allah only. So the knowledge of the unseen belongs to whom? To Allah. No one knows what is going to happen tomorrow. No one. No one. So that's why we don't go to diviners, soothsayers, fortune tellers, etc. Or another example for this minor shirk is swearing by other than Allah. You swear, some people they swear by their honor, by their dignity, by among the Arabs, I swear by the head of my child, okay? Sometimes some people they swear by the Prophet. Among the Arabs, this is, I don't know if you have this in your area. Do you say that? Okay, they swear by the name of the Prophet. They say, one Nabi. I swear by the Prophet. So this is minor shirk. And it can be major shirk, depending on the 
situation. The third type of shirk is hidden shirk, hidden, inconspicuous, inconspicuous shirk, something very, very subtle, something very hard to feel, and that is what? Riya, showing off, it is the Riya, to do things not for the sake of Allah, you do things for showing off. Masha Allah, your speech, wonderful. You really drive the masses. You really make us feel happy. You really, you really, and you feel, mm, mm, feel happy about yourself, and your head grows, and you start also to believe yourself that you are a sheikh, and you are imam. Are you following? Let us come down to earth. Imam Malik, Imam Malik, Imam Dar al Hijrah. A delegation came from Spain and the Lucia with a list of questions and they asked Imam Malik. Every time they ask him, I don't know it. I don't know it. I don't know it. I don't know it. And he answered only a few questions. They said, Oh Imam, what should we tell the people in Andalusia? We traveled and covered all this distance. Imam Malik said, Tell them Malik doesn't know. No problem. It's not a big deal. That is the fear of Allah. That's the real ilm. The real ilm is to fear Allah. That you know before you give the fatwa, you are signing on behalf of Allah. Imam Ibn Al Qayyim, Rahimahullah, he compiled a book called A'lamul Muwaqi'een Arrab Al Alameen. The towering and pioneers, the towering figures who signed on behalf of Allah. He meant the scholars, the ulama, the sahaba. When someone comes to ask them a fatwa, he will say, go and ask my brother. They try to escape and avoid the fatwa. Then the, the second will do the same thing. The third, the fourth, until it comes back to the first. Why? Are we more knowledgeable than the sahaba? No. But the fear of Allah, Al Khashia, Taqwa Allah Azza wa Jal. So let us be practical. I remember I will not mention a name. A brother reverted to Islam. And this is a sickness among the Muslims, by the way. The moment someone reverts to Islam, if he is, for instance, was a professor or something, or a writer of some books, or he is a free thinker or whatever, immediately we make him Imam. True or not? And we take him touring the country in our platforms, addressing the Muslims, when the poor guy doesn't know the basics of Islam. And then we ask him questions, and the guy doesn't know. So this brother, who became a Muslim, happened to be a communist before. He has doctorate in philosophy. And he started talking about Islam, but he was making, was making blunders and mistakes. So in one of the conferences, the scholars, they asked him 100 questions. The scholars listed down 100 questions for him, and he could not answer them. So they told him, listen, when you became a Muslim, we like that too much. Alhamdulillah. But you have to bear in mind that you have to start from the alphabets, from KG1, kindergarten. And that's how you have to learn Islam. Don't expect that you become a scholar also in Islam when you don't know Islam. So let us understand our deen and the basics of Islam. So this is the first trap, which is the shirk. And you can only avoid falling into the trap of shirk if you know the tawheed. Second trap is the bid'ah. What is the definition of bid'ah? Before I quote the definition of bid'ah, I ask a simple question. See this glass of water? It's not full, right? Always remember this example. Can I add more water to it? Can I? Can I or not? Okay. But if it is full, can I add? Because it is complete, right? So what accepts addition? The complete or the incomplete? The incomplete accepts additions. Now, is our deen complete or incomplete? Are you sure? Mm. Good. 
Allah says in the Quran, اليوم أكملت لكم دينكم وأتممت عليكم نعمتي ورضيت لكم الإسلام دينا. Today I have completed your deen and completed my favor upon you. And I have chosen Al-Islam as a religion and as a deen and a way of life for you. So if the deen, my dear brothers and sisters, is complete, will it accept additions? No. So anything added to the deen is not acceptable, simply because the deen is what? Complete. Barakallahu feekum. So all the innovations are unacceptable in Islam. Anything added to the deen is rejected because the deen is complete. That's why Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, "Man ahdata fi amrina hada ma laysa minhu fahuwa rad." Whoever innovates and invents in our deen, in our matter, anything, it will not be accepted. It will be rejected because the deen has been completed. Have you heard this word? Bid'ah hasana. Have you heard it before? Good innovation, good bid'ah. They say, but this is good bid'ah. What made it good? Number one. Number two. If it is good, that means the deen is in need of it. If the deen is in need of it, that means the deen is incomplete. Are you following? If the deen accepts innovations, that means the deen is incomplete. And if the deen is incomplete, Allah says it is complete. So which one should we follow? What Allah says. So the deen, my dear brothers and sisters, should remain as it is, as it was 1400 years ago. Never add anything. Don't put your own words. Don't put your own ideas. Don't do that. Keep this deen and maintain this deen and it is pristine form and it is original form don't add to it otherwise we will be like those who preceded us so the deen has been completed that's why there is no room for bid'ah in the deen so what is bid'ah what is the definition of bid'ah the definition of bid'ah it is an invented method it is an invented method, a way in the deen, this is the key word, in the deen, that is not supported by an evidence, explicit evidence, either in the Quran or in the authentic traditions of the Prophet So anything in the deen that is not approved of, either by the kitab or the sunnah, it is bid'ah. You find bid'ahs in the salah. Bid'ahs in the Siyam. One of the students of knowledge, he compiled a book, this size, volume. Guess what? What's the name of the book? Akhta'ul Musalleen. The mistakes the people, the Musalleen, the praying people make. One volume, full of mistakes. So the bid'ahs are everywhere. People are doing bid'ahs. Why? Because they don't know the sunnah. You can only avoid bid'ah if you know the sunnah. If you don't know the sunnah, you will fall into the bid'ah naturally. And when you leave the sunnah, you fall into the bid'ah. For instance, people they have deserted the sunnah of aqiqah. You know aqiqah? When a child is born, on the seventh day you slaughter a sheep or goat, two for the boy, one for the girl, and you shave the head of the baby, and you weigh it and you give sadaqah, that is sunnah. People, they have deserted that. And they have replaced it with what? Birthday party. So after one year, we celebrate. Happy birthday to you. Right? That's what we do. So when you leave a sunnah, a bid'ah takes over. When you leave the sunnah, bid'ah replaces it. And I want you to know, my dear brothers, the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, so that you will differentiate between the Bid'ah and the Sunnah. Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ are four types, write them down. Four types. The saying 
of the Prophet Sallallahu This is Sunnah Qawliya. Sunnah Fi'liya, the actions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The third, Sunnah Taqririya, the approvals of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Number four, Sunnah Tarkiya, Sunnah Tarkiya, which means the things the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did not do in spite of the need. In spite of the need. So the first one is clear, saying the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Actions, the things the Prophet Sallallahu did, pray as you have seen me praying. These are actions. Approvals, something happened in front of him and he kept quiet. That means it is what? Permissible or impermissible? Permissible, otherwise he could not keep quiet. He would have corrected. For instance, always you'll find in the books, the scholars always give this example, always. You know, there is an animal, a reptile, lives in Arabia called Adab, Adab, which is lizard. You know the lizard? Big size. So the Arabs, they eat it. So it was brought to the Prophet Sallallahu and it was cooked. And the Prophet Sallallahu was about to touch it. And it was the habit of the Prophet Sallallahu to ask always about the food. But that day he was, he didn't ask and he started touching the, the meat. They told him, oh Prophet of Allah, this is dab, dab. So he left it. He didn't eat. So Khalid ibn al-Walid immediately, he asked, Khalid ibn al-Walid immediately he asked, is it haram or Prophet of Allah? He said, no, it's not haram. So Khalid took it. He said, I dragged the plate, I took the plate, and I started eating it, and the Prophet Sallallahu was watching me. This proves what? Is dab halal or haram? Halal. Another example of his approvals, as in Hadith Bukhari, Jabir ibn Abdullah said, Kunna na'zil wal Qur'anu yanzil. We were practicing coitus interruptus when the Qur'an was coming down. Which means, had the coitus interrupt us unlawful, Allah would have revealed something regarding that. Are you following? Now, I conclude. People, they raise the question, the microphone is bid'ah, electricity is bid'ah, cars are bid'ah, sayyara are bid'ah. These are good innovations. How you can now say this is haram? We go back to the definition. The bid'ah which is haram in the dunya or in the deen? Tell me. In the deen. In the dunya we want you to make bid'ah. We want you to make microphones. We want you to make cars, all Muslims. But the deen, leave it. But the Muslims, they left the dunya for the kuffar. And the deen, where Allah told them, don't touch it, they started making their own new deen. The opposite. The opposite, exactly. Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when he reached Medina, the people of Medina, they were farmers, and they were pollinating, pollinating the palm trees. So they asked the Prophet, should we pollinate the palm trees this year? He said, no. And the produce, the fruit became very bad, bad quality. They came and said, you said, don't pollinate. He said, we prophets of Allah were sent not to teach you how to run your mundane life. You are the experts. As long as you do it within the framework of the Sharia, ah, may Allah increase our knowledge in the deen, and may Allah Azza wa Jal guide all the Muslims to the straight path. Ameen. And may Allah reward all of you, brothers and sisters, for your patience and attendance. Barakallahu feekum. Jazakumullahu khaira. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Jazakallahu khaira. May Allah reward you, Sheikh Salam al Amri. Inshallah, we are going to have questions and answers. Just a brief run through we have one mic here at the front of the auditorium, we have one other which is just behind it, and we have one for the sisters, inshallah. Please keep your question very brief because we want to facilitate the, as much questions to be asked in a limited time. As well, if there are any non-Muslims, we would like to give first preference of asking questions to the non-Muslims.
And finally, we will begin with the front mic, going to the second, then to the sisters in a clockwise rotation. So we will begin with the first question from the brother here. Go ahead, brother. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum assalam rahmatullah. I am Uzamil Sheikh and I am a business management student. So my question regarding the seven obstacles for entering Jannah is with the seventh one. Direct confrontation with Shaitan. So Shaitan being intangible, we can't see him. So how can it be a direct confrontation? Okay. The direct confrontation here, it is metaphoric. Means that the Shaitan will use all his efforts. You know what, brother? You overcome the first, the second. How many stations you crossed? Six. So what remained? Only one station, one trap, and you will enter what? The Jannah. So here the Shaitan will not spare any effort. He will try all his best to harm you. That's why Imam Ibn Qayyim called it, this is the wrestling. That means you will face all types of afflictions, all types of trials. You might be killed. You might be imprisoned. You will face troubles everywhere, tribulations everywhere. Because this is the way. You are almost there, approaching the Jannah, reaching the Jannah. So the shaitan will not leave you alone. So this is the most difficult one. Okay? That's why it's called you are struggling with your nafs, struggling with all the human jinn around you and human devils around you, etc. Next question from the sisters, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum assalam wa Brother, my name is Rubina and I'm a teacher. My question is, you spoke about palmistry and fortune telling. My question is, if someone has done black magic on me and I want to undo it, am I permitted to do so? And if not, then what should I do? Are you permitted to do so? What means by so? Doing what? Undoing black magic someone else has done on me. Yeah, by going to the soothsayers. No, by reading Quranic ayah. Alhamdulillah, that is the cure. That's the remedy. See, this cure is the remedy, the Qur'an is the remedy. So if someone is affected by the black magic, you read in yourself. That's why prevention is better than cure. As a matter of fact, Prophet Muhammad he taught us that every night before you go to sleep, you take wudu. And before you sleep, you collect your hands like this, and you blow. And you read, قُلْ Allah Wahad, قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ الْفَلَقِ قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ النَّاسِ And you wipe, and you start from the end of the neck, okay, the upper part of the neck, and you bring your hands like this, and you wipe your body three times. This is a protection. This is a protection. And you do this even for your children. And you read Ayatul Kursi. You read what? Ayatul Kursi. Allahu la ilaha illahu al hayyul qayyum. And you read the end of Surah Al-Baqarah. And you read Surah Al-Mulk. So then you will be protected from the evils. And the Prophet ﷺ used to read on Al-Hasan and al Hussein As children, he used to read in them. Ruqya. So read in yourself and, and your children, inshaAllah. May Allah protect our children and your children. Ameen. Assalamu alaikum. I'm Alia Khan and I'm a student of psychology. It is said in the Quran, Did you not see the one who took his desires as his God? So following your desires, what type of shirk is it? Does it come under hidden shirk or minor shirk? It depends on the magnitude of the desire. Okay? It can be major shirk, it can be minor, it can be hidden. The hidden, always I want you to memorize this dua. I'll elaborate a little bit here. The hidden one, you memorize this dua. This is the cure for it. Allahumma. And I recommend that every Muslim should obtain the copy of uh, Husn al-Muslim, the fortress of the Muslim. So memorize the adhkar. Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min an ushrika bika shay'an wa ana a'lam wa astaghfiruka lima la a'lam. So memorize this insha'Allah. The desire can be major shirk. What stopped Abu Lahab from accepting Islam? His own desire. What prevented Abu Jahl? His own desire. What prevented Fir'aun? His own desire. So your desire became your God, your ilah. So that's why your desire should comply with the commands of God. Your desire should comply with the instructions of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if your desire tells you to do this, 
and your Lord commands you to do this, follow what your Lord says and disobey your desires. So it depends. That's why it is shirk. Following the desire is shirk. It is ilah. It's another God. That's why Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu said in the hadith, Ta'isa Abdul Dinar, Ta'isa Abdul Dirham, Ta'isa Abdul Khamisa, Ta'isa Abdul Qatifa, Ta'isa wa intakasu wa daishika falam tukush. The meaning, woe to him, the worshipper of the dirham, the worshipper of the dinar, the worshipper of the khamisa, which is piece of cloth, type of textile, garment or things like that. And woe to him, the worshipper, may, when he is pricked by a thorn, that thorn may remain in his body forever. Have you seen a worshipper of dirham and dinar? Have you seen a person worshipping the dollar and the pound and the euro? Putting it and prostrating? No. What does it mean, worshipper of dirham? That the motivation, what preoccupies him, his deity, what he thinks about it day and night is only money, money. So money is his God. Irrespective whether it is halal or haram. So many people, they are worshippers for the money, worshippers for the false deities. May Allah Azza wa Jal increase our knowledge in the deen and protect us from all the deceptions and tricks of the cursed one. And may Allah guide all of us and may Allah keep us steadfast upon the deen. Ameen, ameen, ameen. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.